we opted for a distributed structure, which was in essence a precursor of cloud computing that we all know today, and we called it the, the grid. With the grid, you are able to share resources, computing resources, storage resources. So you are able to share a, a lot of computers connected to, together and be able to use them as a single big computational resource. The tier zero computer center operates as just one part of the Large Hadron Collider computing grid, which is a worldwide organization, federation of data centers that process the data that is um, produced by detectors around the Large Hadron Collider. There are uh, around one, 150 computing centers. Tier 0 is the computing center at CERN. In Tier 1, we have 11 uh, big computing centers that are available there for us uh, every day of the year, uh, anytime. For the four experiments, only last year, uh, there were like 30 petabytes of data. This data all ends up in the Tier 0 data center. Then it is massaged a little bit, processed, and then it's sent off to Tier 1 data centers for further processing. The different LHC detectors are connected to the Sun Computing Center with a dedicated network of 10 gigabytes per second network. So it's a very powerful network. And they store this data permanently in tape storage. Then CERN uh, is connected also through dedicated links of 10 gigabytes per second as well to 11 computing centers all around the world. This data is uh, transferred depends on the experiments it was to one or another. And then we have hundreds of other computing centers that are part of this uh, WLCG, this LHC computing grid, where we are also processing and storing the, the data. So you see the data is doing a, a very big journey all around the globe. <laughs> if I'm Professor John Doe, uh, working out of the university in Italy, I would want to know what happened in a specific detector or in a specific sub-detector of a detector. I might request a file that would then reflect a recording of what happened at that time. And this file might be stored in my data center. I might have a cached copy of it. It might be stored in a data center that's completely in a different part of the world. You know, it could be in a server somewhere in the US or it could be retrieved from the tier zero data center here at CERN. This file then will come back to me through a unified file system that spans all the organizations that, uh, that work with CERN that are um, on the grid. And I would see it as if it were in my local file system. And if that file, for example, is not on disk but on tape, obviously I would have to wait longer because there's probably a queue to the tape robot and then the tape robot has to go get my tape has to read it, then serve the file to me, and so on and so on. So if I'm lucky, I'm going to get it in a fraction of a second. If I'm unlucky, I might get it in an hour or maybe in several hours, but this is um, relatively infrequent these days. One thing is the storage of the data, and another thing is the computing of that data. First, you have to make sure the data is stored somewhere in a permanent way so we can retrieve this uh, whenever we need to. And then you need the, the computing power to be able to run all these programs, the physicists write, to be able to find the Higgs boson or reproduce the conditions after a collision and see what has happened, which particles have been created. You need a lot of computing for this. So you need both, both sides. You need the storage and you need the computing power. People initially thought, why don't we build a big data center just right at CERN? But that was not really a good solution because, first of all, we wouldn't have too much to do with it when we don't really do anything else. So there would be only one specific purpose for it. And then all the other scientists that would like to participate in this effort would not have the opportunity to do so. If they all want to use this powerful grid you've created, how do you prioritise? How is it decided who gets to use the power and when? There is a very important component in the grid, which is what we call the middleware. The middleware is, is the software that is actually making look all these uh, scattered resources as a huge computa computational resource. So thanks to the middleware, we have a way to prioritise, also a way to make sure only the, the right users are using the resources. So security is also an important aspect, making sure the right people are using the right resources. We allocate computing power or storage per experiment, so the middleware is actually actually managing all this and making sure um, the priorities are respected and everybody is able to, to do their job. The grid is called the grid because there is an analogy with the electricity grid. So electricity is something that you don't actually care where it comes from. In fact, it is coming from different providers. It could be we the wind, it could be coal that brings together electricity. You just plug in your toaster or your radio and it works. So the idea of the computing grid would be this, and we are still far from, from, from this uh, uh, use that, that we have with the electricity grid. Now we are not able to say, 
I connect my whatever uh, computer and then I know I would have a, a limited access to computing resources that who know where they are. This is not possible yet, but that, that is the idea behind the, the grid, that we would be able to use it in the same way we use electricity. It's not hardware that you can buy in your typical computer shop, but it's not very far from that. You know, essentially what we run in the computing center are PC servers, sometimes with some improvements or some experimental hardware, but the majority of production is something that you can buy off a list from a vendor today. Now, that is what we have in the data center, but if you go closer to the experiments and you want to look at the systems that collect the data, they become more and more custom. The grid was designed before we knew that the web would be a big thing. It's just another protocol to access files. So the World Wide Web is, again, just another protocol to access files on remote servers. And in this case, we need slightly different characteristics than you uh, have with uh, standard web processing. You know, we would like to process bigger files, we would like to transfer them uh, faster, or we would like to synchronize files across multiple locations in the world. You know, the World Wide Web can't do that, but the protocols that sit on top of these files that interface between us and those files really can make that happen. We have uh, increased uh, uh, our capacity to, to execute all these jobs, benefiting from the fact that we can count on all these computers. Large Hadron Collider Computing Grid today has probably 350,000 computing cores. And, you know, if, you, if we look at that figure, uh, one hour later, it's probably going to be more than that, so it keeps changing all the time. We thought at the beginning that the LHC was going to produce something like 15 petabytes of data, and when we turned uh, on the LHC and we ran it, uh, we went far beyond our uh, expectations, so we've generated much more data than what we thought at the beginning. I think it's amazing that these 350,000 processors can work together, they can produce results that feed the scientists you know, across the whole world, and that out of these results, you can then produce a plot which changes the way we understand physics. So the physicists definitely can consume any amount of computing you're going to show them. So if you're telling me you have 10 new computers, they would immediately like to use them and they will surely find new types of analysis to run on those computers and they will put them to good use. But on the other hand, you've uh, asked about a very interesting topic, which is that of new technologies and that of whether we need to adapt our software and our way of thinking about computers to be able to profit fully from those technologies. And if you take, you know, the topic of accelerators, for example, which is, uh, you know, either GPUs or devices like the Knight's family, like the Knight's Corner from, um, from Intel, which they also call the Xeon Phi, um, you can't really take the software that you have today and just put it on that device like that and expect that your, your computation is going to be accelerated. You have to put some more effort into that. Processor performance still keeps improving along with Moore's law, but now more than ever, we need to put more thinking into um, what changes in computing mean for us. What do we have to do to adapt to those changes? How do we take advantage of next generation technology? Like for example, you know, there might be a new uh, processors coming up. They have new features such as you know, white vectors. You, you might have to do vectorization, you might have to do multi or many core processing. And some of the software that you've designed 20 years ago might not be ready for this because nobody has expected that things would develop this way. So I think there's, you know, despite the fact that we're very efficiently using the computers we have at our disposal today, there are still many, there are still many challenges ahead of us to make sure that we can profit from the most uh, recent technologies. The LHC has a voluntary uh, computing project which is called LHC at Home where you would be helping physicists to uh, carry out uh, simulations that are very important for them to afterwards compare them with the real data and this won't uh, increase the grid we use for the real data but it's going to be a very important part in the processing of some of the work that the physicists need to do anyway 